Hello and welcome back to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. Back in studio again for part two of my interview with 1st Franklin District State Rep Steve Hewlett. We talked a lot about the pipeline and about natural gas and energy and transgender rights in the first segment. Now I want to talk about something that's been debated for a long time, but hasn't really been acted upon until recently, and that is public records reform. And now there have been a lot of layers to this. In a lot of communities, in some communities in Franklin County, you have people using the existing public records laws in many ways against towns they disagree mm -hmm. with. Um, but let's, let's go back to the beginning here in public records reform. Now, Peter Cocott, your colleague from Northampton, has been taking the lead on this thing, but what do you know about the new reform coming through? So I was really pleased to have been a member of the six-member conference committee that negotiated and, and endorsed a final version that passed the House and Senate unanimously, uh, bipartisan, and it's on the governor's desk as we're speaking. I'm sure he is going to be signing this um, in early June. But um, one of the reasons I really wanted to be involved in this is what you referred to, that um, the public records law um, is 40 years old. It's has been pretty um, outdated. It doesn't have provisions for electronics, uh, you know, email, websites, what have you, different ways of delivering information. Um, but it also has been a burden, I think, to many small towns. Yeah. I represent small towns, so I was really glad to be involved in this heavily over the past uh, year um, in trying to respond to many of the issues that our small towns in Franklin County have had. Um, as you referenced, some of those problems have been um, when uh, people ask for public records, um, not necessarily to glean the information, but to harass yeah. town officials. Our town officials uh, are stretched thin, uh, particularly in the small towns where they're usually part-time, they're often volunteer, and um, many people have been harassed, really, by um, excessively voluminous um, and time-consuming public records requests, which also cost money to the towns. So one of the reasons I was really pleased um, to be you know, very closely involved in this, and, and the speaker appointed me to, to do work on this over the last summer and the fall and help craft a final bill, is to respond to those kinds of real life issues that small towns face in terms of cost, access, responsiveness. And I think we've done that. Um, Peter Cocott has been a great leader in this. He's our, my neighbor and friend um, from Northampton and we, you know, his district butts up against mine. And uh, so we were able to work on this together. And, you know, there's no question that the public should have access um, to the business of their government. They pay for their government, they pay for those documents, they pay for the workers who oversee the documents. Therefore, sh they should be able to get them in a timely and responsive way. Most public records uh, requests are fulfilled in a timely, reasonable way. Some, which have been high-profile stories uh, in the Boston Globe, um, where people get really get hassled uh, when they ask for records. That's happened more at the state level, state agencies. Mm -hmm. There's a very famous uh, case, which um, I think has, has always been brought up here, where um, one of the newspapers, maybe it was the Boston Globe, asked for some records from the state police. Um, and the state police responded, <laughs> we can provide you with those records, but it's going to cost you two and a half million dollars no. uh, for the time of uh, copying, finding them, redacting them, copying them, et cetera, et cetera. L lawyers to look at them, you name it. Well, that's just absurd. Um, but um, so we wanted to get around that sort of thing by making it clear what the obligations of both state and local government are to provide records. And in the case of the small towns, we wanted to give them some special dispensation, if you will, some extra time to respond. Um, the state agencies and larger municipalities in this final bill, um, the first two hours of fulfilling a request are free uh, for people, but for small towns under 20,000 population, um, so that actually includes every community in Franklin County and most of them in Hampshire County, um, they can charge from the first minute. Uh, for those first two hours. Yeah. Uh, so that's important because a lot of these folks uh, working in town halls, um, you know, they're not full-time. This isn't their major responsibility, but they will be the public records access officer. We require every community to have someone designated to do this, and there are clear timelines and expectations and methods of, of um, appealing to the Commonwealth, uh, to the Secretary of State, who is the overseer of public records, the supervisor. 
And then if that's still not resolved, if there are still conflicts about access to particular types of records, um, then people can avail themselves of going to superior court. So um, I think we've done a lot for small towns. We have an anti-harassment provision in there where if a town feels it is being harassed by a frequent requester um, for information that may not be relevant or um, germane and it's just time consuming and costly, they can appeal to the Attorney General. Yeah, I think that's um, where you get into yeah. the question, is the question of, of relevance, but how does this specifically address meeting minutes? Because the, the real issue, I'm thinking specifically of the town of Ashfield, uh, when there was an argument over uh, a piece of public property there and there were constant requests for meeting minutes and the town was always behind in transcribing those minutes from select board meetings which can be tough to do if it's a three and a half hour meeting. It takes, it's time consuming and the people they didn't have the, the, the bodies in town hall mm -hmm. to be able to do that work. So if, if I come in and I want minutes from the last five select board meetings, what are my options? What does this bill allow? So um, that gets a little bit into the territory of a companion law, the open, uh, the, um, open meeting law. Yeah. And, and open meetings um, are required to take minutes to have an agenda, to post that agenda. Uh, and to take minutes and to make those uh, available in a timely way. Usually a town has to approve or a body has to approve the minutes of a previous meeting and then they're public. So um, if, if someone going forward after this becomes law wants the minutes of a particular meeting, um, they will be able to get them in a timely way. Um, and what we're really suggesting is going forward as towns beef up their electronic capabilities, as we bring broadband to our yes. small towns, because that's a big part of this, that, um, that they be, people can be directed to the electronic record. And as I look at many which of Which is usually our record. Which is our record. Yeah. And, and usually, I'm finding these days, most small towns, even if they don't have full broadband capability, have good websites. And more and more of them are putting their town meeting minutes and, and board minutes on the website. So sometimes just complying with a public records request for meeting minutes is saying, it's right here on our website. Would you like me to print it out for you or give you the your, your, you know link to it? So. Um, I, th I think it's going to complement our open meeting law uh, by having a good public records law that's very clear. And uh, something that, like minutes of a meeting, I think, is something people should be able to expect access to, and I think they'll get it. Was there any ever thought, ever any thought, excuse me, to the idea, because, I mean, what, part of what FCAT does is we cover as many or all, as gov all government meetings pretty much in the four towns mm -hmm. that we serve. Is there ever been a thought to, to somehow incorporating local access centers like, like ours to be able to be an organic part of a town's record keeping? I mean, it would seem to me that it would make a lot of sense rather than having to duplicate everything. We've got all these things on mm. tape. We've got them all now on YouTube. Yep. Um, people can go online and watch pretty much any meeting that happens in their town. Yeah. Why not, why not take advantage <clears throat> of that resource? It's a great idea. Um, we didn't discuss it as part of this legislation, but as technology evolves and I don't see why it can't be part of the process. Um, you know, some of the things I learned about technology that's either here or is coming, for example, is um, that you're recording these. There are software programs that can turn that into text. Yeah. Uh, you, can take, you can take your audio or video recordings of a meeting, and uh, they're digital, um, so they're on a computer, um, and you can have software in that computer that can turn that into text on a page. So we might assist communities. We, and by the way, I should say, we are setting up a fund in this uh, legislation um, to, to assist communities in transitioning into new technology. So there is money behind there it. There is some money behind it, um, funded by um, uh, court awards. If a court finds that right. someone has you know, improperly withheld if, if uh, documents in a state agency or a city or town might have to pay some you know, court fees or attorney's fees, that uh, some of that will go into this fund. So I could see as time go, goes on and technology gets better and more affordable, that we could have that kind of resource available either for a region, like here at FCAT, um, you could uh, provide texts of mi minutes that you've, re meetings that you've recorded. Uh, and make those available through town websites and in town clerk's offices. Throughout. Well, I can tell you that there are some town officials who depend on us to be able to take those minutes. Yeah. In fact, if we don't have a, a particular meeting from a particular town up within a given number of days, mm. we get calls. You saying, get calls. We, we need that meeting so we can do the minutes. Interesting. And so I, I think 
I just think that it would be a way, especially if there were some sort of a way to to compensate the, the access yeah. stations for doing it. Yeah. Because it does, it requires a certain amount of work to do all this stuff. It's a great idea. Um, I think we should keep talking about right. that. Well, I think that I mean, could happen. Um, that would be, it would be good to, to, to feel like there was some role that local access, without becoming an arm of government, we certainly right. don't want that. We're still an independent agency. Right, right? exactly. But we, we could definitely be helpful in that regard. So this public records reform, just to put it to bed, when can we expect you said that the governor has has the bill, right? It's on the governor's desk. Right. Um, the um, the house passed it on uh, Wednesday um, this past week, which would have been uh, what the twenty uh, around the twentieth. Uh, Can he uh, line item veto that and take um, certain things out? He could he could send it back with some vetoes or a message or something. I tend to think he won't. Uh, I think there's a lot of consensus. It also you know passed unanimously in the House and Senate. Hmm. Um, our six-member conference committee, which is bipartisan, um, four Democrats and two Republicans, three each from the House and Senate, we passed it unanimously, we endorsed it. So I think the governor is likely to sign it. If he has any suggestions for ways to improve it, um, he might send back a further amendment or something. But um, I think I, I'm expecting him to embrace it and it all takes effect uh, January 1st, 2017. Okay, let's talk about farm issues. When the Senate president was here, he talked about an omnibus farm bill that the Senate was reporting out, and it hadn't yet to go to the House when we'd spoken to him. Uh, this has a number of pieces in there that had never really been addressed and, and plugged some holes, and is the first omnibus farm bill of its kind to help local agriculture. And Where do you think that's going to go in the House? Has it already been acted on? It's in the House. We haven't acted on it yet, but we're working on it. It's currently in the, in the House Ways and Means Committee, so my committee. And... Um, now the, the, the budget is passed for us, uh, we'll be going into budget conference soon, but um, I'm working on it with the chair of our agriculture committee and I'm hopeful that in the final two months of the session we're going to be able to get this bill done. We'll probably make a few changes, uh, a few additions perhaps to what the Senate has done, but the Senate, you know, I think did a very good job. Uh, it, was, it came out of a joint House Senate committee right. and the Senate got it first. Um, but. You know, agriculture is, is so important to the economy and the quality of life in the, in the Pioneer Valley, uh, but it's increasingly important throughout the Commonwealth. Um, people care where their food's coming from. They want local food. Our restaurants are featuring local foods more and more. Farm to table. Farm to That's table. That's the big thing right now. Farm to table is the big thing. So we have incredible opportunities to enhance that, um, both the preservation of farmland, training people for farm jobs, uh, for careers in agriculture, assisting with marketing, uh, new technologies, food safety. Um, some bills that I have sponsored for a number of years have been incorporated in this and we're looking at more. You know, we need to increase the availability of processing facilities for uh, meat and for poultry in Massachusetts and you know, try to cut through some of the regulations. We, we never want to compromise food safety and public health, but we also want to make it more economical and, and a little bit easier for those people who want to raise local beef and, and chickens and poultry. But um, so there's a lot to do. I, I'm hopeful that by the time we end our session at the end of July, that will be on the governor's desk as well. One of the things that I find fascinating in the Senate version of the bill was the idea of, of putting together a program to train veterans coming back mm. from war to go into agriculture. And as we've been seeing a lot lately, it seems like family farms, the next generation isn't necessarily wanting to take right. the, the mantle. So you've got a lot of farmland, especially in this area, that is going either untended or is being rented out to some other mm -hmm. bigger farm. And so it seems like a great idea. And you know, we're just getting past Memorial Day and we all have our minds on the veterans at this time of year. Uh, that sounds like a really good idea. It really is because um, you know so much of our farmland in Franklin County is protected in perpetuity through agricultural preservation restrictions APR program, which has now been around for 40 plus years. We were the first in the nation, and so farmers own their farms with those development rights attached. And very often, the children of farmers may not want to continue, um, <coughs> and that land can only be passed on and sold at ag value to someone who's gonna work it as a farm. So helping veterans get a foothold in agriculture, I mean, it's hard work, there's no question about it, but it's a very rewarding way of life and we happen to be blessed with the best soil in yeah. North America, if not the world, right here in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, and a great infrastructure, I mean, the advocacy through, from organizations like CESA 
you know, we're doing farm to table, we're doing farm to school, we have uh, breakfast programs, we have the senior farm share program. I mean, there's so much energy and activity and economic development work around agriculture right here. So I'm hopeful that enticing veterans to get into the field and giving them some resources to get started, training and capital, um, will be a, a, real, a real boon to people who are ready to retire from farming. Uh, but may not have a succession plan uh, in place. You mentioned the economic impact. You know, this is the few years now we've been without Williams Corn and Deerfield, and the reason is because uh, the father got out of the business, and the, and the kids didn't want to take it up. Yeah. And I mean that Williams Corn was oh, the corn absolutely. in this area for. I mean, and, and not only in this area, but in much of the region. You know, they they uh, sent that stuff to a lot of, of supermarkets mm -hmm. and restaurants. And that, I mean, not to say we don't have great corn here. We got Cheswick, we have Golanka. There's all kinds of of really good stuff, but you know, it was it seemed like such a loss yeah. to to lose that tradition, just like with Oxford Pickle. I mean, there were right. certain farming traditions that have gone by the wayside, but to to be able to bring some veterans and, and like I told the senator, it wouldn't be bad if you're a veteran coming back from war to spend some time plowing a field and you know get your mind right. If, Absolutely, after what you've been through. and and we have the Stockbridge School of Agriculture exactly. right down the road uh, if people want to pursue academic. Uh, interest in agriculture, you know, we're better. We're better. Now, speaking of veterans, according to your website, you have a veteran support bill you've been working on. Talk a little bit about that. So um, we just did a, a bill um, this week in anticipation of Memorial Day coming up in the House. Um, the uh, home bill, which is sort of the third phase of a series of bills we've been working on for veterans um, over the last several years. Uh, this is one that deals a lot with veterans housing. Um, and also with the soldiers' homes, and we want to strengthen our two soldiers' homes. We're lucky to have Holyoke right down the road. Right. Um, but to, to work on innovative ways, unfortunately, we have homeless veterans, uh, which is just a disgrace in this country for people who have served uh, to be able to not find adequate housing, pr proper housing, and be living on the streets. So um, we've done a lot with that. Uh, that bill is moving through the Senate now and will probably be on the governor's desk very soon. Um, we're also uh, continuing to uh, do our Valor Act uh, programs. Um, we're assisting veterans with additional um, um, educational opportunities, and I think we've done more. In fact, we are nationally recognized as the state that has done the most for veterans over the past dozen years. I know that there have been individual communities that have, have set a goal to wipe out veterans' homelessness mm -hmm. in their communities by the end of the year. I know that was I'm not sure how that's been going, but I was astounded to hear the percentage of homeless people that are veterans. I just can't it, imagine. It, it's it defies, amazing. It defies logic. You know, and I think a lot of it is that people do come home uh, from combat or being, uh, you know, in a, a combat area um, with a lot of things going on in their head and a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, and those often make it difficult for them to function in the civilian world when they get back. So they need incredible supports, um, and they deserve every kind of help we can give them. Let's talk about another thing that we talked about last time, um, the bottle bill. There was an effort to try and, I don't know if gut's the right word, but it certainly seemed like a gutting when you mm -hmm. talk about going back from, from a nickel return to one cent for a year and then getting rid of it. The idea, of course, being to create one recycling stream. Now, the last time we spoke, it didn't look like that was going to go anywhere. Anything new on that at all? No. Um, I mean, it's pending. It could go somewhere, but I don't sense a big appetite in the legislature to do it. I know I've heard from many constituents in Franklin County who just say, leave the bottle bill alone. It works. And uh, I think the you know, grocery manufacturers, the supermarkets, the bottling companies, they're behind this push, and they're trying to build off what they see as momentum for having killed the expansion of the bottle bill two years ago in the election in 2014. And um, they did that by spending an awful lot of money because before any campaign had started, the public was very much in favor of expanding the bottle bill to right. cover juices and iced teas and bottled water and so on. By the time several million dollars had been spent on the other side, you know, the vote went the other way. Right. And uh, that's the nature of politics, I think. But um, I, don't, I don't sense that the legislature would, at this point, change what is a successful um, program um, for making sure things get recycled. Um, the bottle bill, the deposit law, it's reduced litter on our roadsides. I don't see how this industry 
uh, proposal would do anything uh, uh, to, to combat litter. I mean, people do pick up a bottle for a nickel. Exactly. Uh, and it also, you know, supports a lot of good, um, you know, I know my, my Boy Scout troop in, in Worthington, we bring all our bottles to the little bin at the transfer station, which they pick up every week and turn into a lot of cash yeah. for the whole town. That's what's bothered me about the debate over the bottle bill this time around is that no one seems to recognize that poor people benefit from yeah. this five cent deposit. I mean, yeah. it, it, you mentioned organizations the other day, same thing, I got hit up for a bag of uh, a bottles from some local little leaguers that were doing a, a collection. And, and I just think that those kinds of little things in some cases can meet the difference for certain people. I mean. I'm not saying that you can make a career necessarily out of scavenging for bottles, but you can make a pretty good chunk of change. Oh yeah, um, and a little bit of spending money, which goes back into the economy. So yeah, you know, yeah. So I, I'm going to predict that we don't uh, make any significant changes here. I'm hoping we don't, and if we, if it ever comes up for a vote, I'll be voting against that change. One thing that doesn't isn't necessarily affect South County, but it affects the region, and that is what's been happening at the French King Bridge mm. and uh, in Gill. Now there have been a number of people that have jumped to their deaths. Uh, the, the most recent suspected of jumping to his death was the former DPW superintendent in Greenfield, John Bean, a tragic story. But it looks like the state's finally gonna put some netting and some cameras on there. I know you are a big part of getting that done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the state's gonna spend almost $700,000 uh, and um, installing cameras, which is something we've been trying to do for a long time. and. The reason for doing that is <clears throat> sometimes the police will get a call, oh, I just saw someone jump off the bridge. And they respond, you know, the, the uh, tactical rescue team will, will respond and so on, and they may not be able to find anyone. And it's not certain if someone really did jump off the bridge. And the, meanwhile, the, time, the town or group of towns have gone to the time and expense and the danger the, to their own personnel of um, trying to do a search and rescue. If we have cameras there, which are linked to the police departments um, on either side of the river, um, then there'll be a record, people will know. Um, also be a 24 seven camera so that if someone is there and they look like they're thinking about jumping and they're not doing it, uh, you can get someone to respond yeah. and ho hopefully talk them out of it. But if someone does jump uh, and makes it to the river, uh, you will know whether it really happened or not. And that's an investment. It's seven hundred thousand dollars, but I'll tell you, it is worth every penny of it in terms of what I'm hearing from law enforcement about how much this is going to be important to them. I didn't realize that was the second highest bridge in Massachusetts. Yeah, I, that was yeah. something that came out of the discussion. I had no idea. I knew it was high. Yeah, but I think the, the Sagamore, I think, is the only one that's mm -hmm. bigger than the French King. Yeah. So, um, Took a while to get it done, and unfortunately, um, we lost some people because of it. But maybe it'll be the, this will change that. I hope so. I hope so. Um, and uh, it will really help people in need who are troubled, and uh, help our law enforcement as well. Now, all you need to do is get some cameras at the Stillwater Bridge to mm. help the Deerfield. <laughs> well, I know Deerfield has a perennial issue and yeah. some problems there, but. Uh, you know, today as we sit here, it's a hot day. I bet there's yeah. a lot of people on the river down there. What about bridges in general? I know that there's discussion about, there's always discussion about roads and bridges and infrastructure, and there's a few bridges in Conway that have seen better yeah. days, and there's concerns about that. Any idea of a potential for some money coming forward for that? We have a bill pending right now, um, which we hope to have up in the House uh, within the next few weeks. Uh, which is a, a small bridge program, particularly for towns like Conway or any of the other towns. Uh, bridges less than 20 feet long, uh, which you know maybe on secondary roads, dirt roads. Um, but you know bridges are so expensive; it's yeah. crazy. A small bridge on a back road can cost nearly a million dollars. Crazy. So it's completely beyond the ability of a town to afford that themselves. So uh, we're promoting this as part of a capital spending plan for the state. Um, we've also funded some of these uh, projects through the Mass Works program, which has already existed. But we're, we're now, and the governor has been very supportive of this. He put the proposal forward to um, uh, really have a, a small bridge program for small towns. And uh, it's, it's, it's long overdue, and I think it's going to be very competitive and, and sought after. And the thing is, it, it, to decide which bridge takes priority, I mean, you can't put a dollar figure on a life that could be no, lost. No, absolutely. But the smaller communities like Conway, you know, they're less likely to have their bridges repaired quick because fewer people travel on them. Well, fewer people travel on them. I mean, we do rely on the state bridge inspection program, um, and they check every bridge on a regular basis, and they rate the bridges, and they inform the towns whether there's a bridge that might have to be closed or reduced to one lane or what have you. Many towns are facing this problem and it presents, 
you know, problems for economic reasons as well as public safety. I've seen bridges that were downgraded such that a fire truck couldn't go over them. Yeah, it's, uh, it's... That's scary. That's scary. Um, you know, it gets to the whole issue of we have not invested in infrastructure in this country for 30 years. Uh, it's not just our state, but it's, it's every place. And infrastructure, roads, bridges that work well and people can drive over efficiently make our economy hum. Uh, they allow people to go to school, to go to work, to get their health care, you name it. And we just haven't done enough. Um, and the voters this fall will have a chance to vote on that with this tax on yeah. millionaires yeah. that passed the legislature. And, and an opportunity, if they feel strongly about it, uh, they could, you know, millionaires will make over a million dollars a year who pay another 4%, which will go right toward transportation and education, which are two big areas. Right. So it will come up actually on the ballot in 2018. 2018, I'm sorry. Yep, that's okay. 2018. Um, it passed, so the House and Senate meet in constitutional convention uh, on a periodic basis to consider amendments to our Constitution. And that's what it would take in order to have something like this fair share tax amendment. Um, some people call it the millionaire's tax. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've been trying to figure out a way to get more funding to education and to transportation because people ask for it, that's what they want, but then on the other hand, uh, they sometimes will vote against it when they have the opportunity, or they'll get really mad that we voted to raise the gas tax. Um, two years ago, they repealed the indexing portion of the gas tax, which would have given us a small increase annually and a predictable amount of money to turn back into our roads and bridges. Um, this proposal, if it's approved again by the legislature, Next again year, it, it right. passed um, uh, in the joint House-Senate session, in the next legislature that takes effect in January of 2017, if they pass it again, then it will go to the ballot and the voters will have a chance to decide in 2018 whether to do it or not. And as you say, if it's approved, it will do a 4% surtax on top of the regular income tax rate, which by that time will be 5%. It's right now 5.1%, but it's scheduled to go down again to 5 and um, so they would be paying 9% on any income above a million dollars. Yeah. And that's income above a million dollars. So, you know, it, I'm told it affects maybe 3,000 people, something like that. I thought so, it was closer to 18,000. 18, but the money can only be spent on two things. Ed, just education, education and transportation. Yeah. So I'm hoping it can allow us to put, put more money into Chapter 70 and reduce the uh, local school assessments to our towns. Um, by having a bigger portion of state-owned uh, or state contribution. I'm hoping it can fully fund regional school transportation. I'm hoping that it will put money into this small bridge program so that we can address all of the bridges in the small towns. Um, so I supported it, but it's ultimately up to the voters um, because, you know, I mean, Stan Rosenberg's fond of saying, you know, we don't have a spending problem, we have a revenue problem. I think it's a combination of both. Um, we have really tightened our belts a lot in the last few years. Um, you know, our, our increase, we're still devoting less to local aid than we did a decade ago. Um, I like working with Charlie Baker. I think he's a good fiscal manager and is trying to make sure state government works well and uh, delivers on the kinds of services it's supposed to. Um, but we do lack some revenue to invest in these things that the people are asking for. And this seems like a fair way to do it. We'll be following it for sure. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Chris. Always Steve, a pleasure. Steve Kulik from the 1st Franklin District has been our guest. As always, this is Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Collins. We'll talk to you next time. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.